Mr. Yeah. All right. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it is now uh, 3.01 on Tuesday, March 8th, 2022. I am Sonny Garza, and Lisa Clark and I co-chair the Livable Places Action Committee. I will now call this meeting to order as a virtual meeting using Microsoft Teams. Uh, as Savita just mentioned, a couple of reminders. Please keep yourself muted and turn off your camera during the meeting. If you're using a cell phone, use star six to mute and unmute. Committee members, um, remember to use the raise your hand feature to uh, and unmute, uh, stating your last name so that you can be recognized by the chair. Again, I remind everyone that the raise your hand feature is only for subcommittee members, not for the public, uh, who will be asked to speak during public comment per the agenda at the end of the meeting. Um, so ladies and gentlemen, if you would prepare to answer the roll call by unmuting yourself, um, I will call your the, your name. Please state your name and present. Uh, Co-chair Sonny Garza is present. Uh, Lisa Clark, Co-chair Lisa Clark, is not present. Bradley Pepper, Bradley Pepper, is not present. Casey Morgan, Casey Morgan, is not present. Curtis Davis. Curtis Davis is not present. Dr. Sherry Smith. I'm here. Dr. Smith is present. Thank you. <laughs> Dustin O'Neill. Dustin O'Neill is not present. Sean Masick. Sean Masick is not present. Fernando Zamaripa. Fernando Zamaripa is not present. Jeff Kaplan. Present. Jeff Kaplan is present. Thank you. Kathy Payton. Happy International Women's Day. Thank you. Kathy Payton is present. I'll take that. Uh, Kirby Lou. Kirby Lou is not present. Lloyd Smith. Commissioner Smith is not present. Luis Guajardo. Luis Guajardo is present. Luis Guajardo is present. Thank you, sir. Matthew Camp. Matthew Camp is not present. Megan Sigler. Sigler present. Megan Sigler, thank you, Commissioner, is present. Uh, Mark Nightingale. Mark Nightingale is not present. Mike Dishberger. Present. Mike Dishberger is present. Thank you, sir. Neil Dykeman. Present. Neil Dykeman is present. Omar Isfar. Present. Omar Isfar is present. Thank you. Peter Friedman. Friedman present. Peter Friedman is present. Sandy Stevens. Sandy Stevens is not present. Scott Kubler. Scott Kubler is present. Kubler is present. Thank you. Steve Curry. Steve Curry is not present. Toby Cole. Toby Cole is Toby present. Toby Cole is present. Thank you. Tyron McDaniel. Tyron McDaniel is not present. Uh, Zion Escobar. Escobar present. Escobar is present. Yohanna Mahmoud. Yohanna Mahmoud is not present. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. I show 13 subcommittee members in attendance. If any of you missed, uh, any of you subcommittee members missed your name call, please speak up now and make yourself known to the committee. Curtis Davis is present. Curtis Davis is present. Thank you. Anyone else? Matthew Camp is present. Matthew Camp is present. Anyone else? That sounds like it. We now have 15 subcommittee members. Thank you all for being here and for your participation. We appreciate it very much. Now, just a couple of quick notes before we begin for everyone who is listening in, and we have quite a few people. Again, please stay muted with your camera turned off during the meeting to minimize background noise and disruptions. If you wish to speak, Enter your name into the chat and you will be called on at the end of the meeting for public comment. If you're using a cell phone, use star six to mute and unmute. And again, during the end, uh, excuse me, during public comment at the end, 
Uh, please state your name and spell your last name out loud. This is a recorded meeting um, so that we can make sure that we have all of that correct. And at that point, you will have two minutes to speak. The chat may not be used for anything other than public speaker request or staff administration information for posted agenda items. The hand raise feature again is only to be used by subcommittee members and staff, not to be used by the public. Public comment per the agenda will be heard at the end of the meeting verbally, um, and you will have two minutes to speak at that time when we call your name. Again, at the end of the meeting, please disconnect or hang up all devices after the chair adjourns the meeting. All right, with that, uh, we have quorum, we have a meeting. I will hand the, this uh, meeting over to Margaret Wallace-Brown for the director's report. Director Wallace-Brown. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I do want to say that I did see Sandy Stevens enter the uh, meeting. She may want to make herself known. Yeah, a moment then. Sandy, are you there? I am here. Thank you. Sorry I'm late. Not at all. No problem. Thank you not, uh, for announcing yourself. Thank you, Margaret. All right, director's report. So I'm going to take a little bit longer on my director's report than I usually do. I usually leave this time for announcements about administrative matters and so forth, but I actually have really good news that I want to share with many of you. And so we're going to have a very brief PowerPoint. Um, Savita, do you have it loaded? Because I am not yes, able to see it right now. OK, so um, I want to share some really good news that uh, we've worked out with Public Works and the offices of resiliency and um, recovery. As, as many of you know, for the past year, the city of Houston has reviewed small lot subdivisions differently based on the driveway configurations that they have. According to changes that were made to Chapter 9 last year, property subdivided with front loading development, the, the drawing on your left, um, they, the city allows a 65% exemption prior to requiring any detention. Um, this is similar to other single family development. It's pretty standard um, the way we treat single family development. But for subdivisions that are accessed through a shared driveway, which is drawn on the right, um, the rule changed last year and the requirement has been significantly greater since then. There is no 65% exemption for this type of driveway configuration. And most of these, my understanding is from the industry that most of these um, configurations now require detention. And um, this is this is be this has become a pretty pretty Excuse big me. disincentive for yes. Make sure everyone is muted. Thank you. Go ahead, Margaret, please. So this has been a pretty big disincentive for shared driveway developments, and we've heard from many of you in the industry that um, you're not doing them any longer because of this detention requirement. Uh, not exactly understanding why that why they're looked at differently. We approached Public Works several months ago and started a conversation about um, changing the way the, the detention rules are applied to them. Um, and after that, we've seen, we, we, we have a success to share with you. So go to the next slide, please. What we did is we walked through with Public Works the, the very similar um, circumstances um, in the impervious area created by each of these two developments. When we showed this slide, it became pretty clear to Public Works and the other groups that were looking at this, that the amount of impervious surface created by the two types of driveways is really virtually the same. And um, what we found out is that the review had been different because the front loading driveways on the left come in primarily individually through the process to be permitted and approved while the ones on the right all come in as a unit and they were just looked at differently. So taking our analysis, um, we have worked with um, Public Works, Resiliency and Recovery Offices and they have agreed that now the um, driveways on the right, though the drawing on the right, will also receive the 65% detention um, exemption. So um, would they are going to begin, I think that the city engineer might be in the room, and if he is, I, I want to give him an opportunity to speak on this, but they're going to be reviewing, re moving towards changing the IDM to even the playing field on these two types of development and allow both of them to have the um, exemption. And um, we see this as a, a, a good step forward. We um, will talk further in this meeting about the um, front driveway circumstances, but to be able to have both of these reviewed in similar fashion 
um, we think is a really big step forward. Um, I'm going to stop my presentation there and I guess answer some questions from the committee if you've got them. Um, and maybe the city engineer might want to step in and um, answer some questions also, but um, questions. Uh, Margaret, I see Peter Friedman's hand raised. Peter, are you there? I am. Thank you. And uh, director, I just wanted to say thank you so much to you and your team for doing that. Um, this has been something, especially on the affordable housing side, that's been um, an issue. And I really appreciate you all jumping on it and working your way through it. Um, I think this is a great resolution. Uh, that said, I, we just received a checklist of new requirements for for um, development, and it seems like they're going to be requiring detention um, for all lots, regardless of impervious cover and regardless of size. Am I um, is that is that correct, or am I did I misinterpret the uh, the checklist that came out? I am unaware of that. You know. <laughs> We, we solve one problem and another one pops up. Um, I am unaware of that. I will will be happy to check into it and um, get back with you. If the city engineer's here, you, you may want to jump in on that. Um, I want to share um, just one. I'm sorry, go ahead. This is Savida, um, director. I just want to say city engineer had uh, um, an issue to take care, so he's not okay. on the call right now. And we are aware of uh, Peter Friedman's concern, and I forwarded it to our leads uh, here, Hector, who has been working with the city engineer. So we are looking into it. Okay, uh, Peter, we'll get you an answer. Savita, go to the next. Go, I, I didn't show all of my slides because I wanted to be brief, but go to the next slide because I do want to point one thing out. Um, you know, we talk about detention on private property but but as we were looking at this circumstance and trying to trying to fix it um, it's, it became clear that the front loading driveways also affect the right of way um, in ways and we'll talk about this in detail in a minute but I did want to show this one slide that when when we're dealing with the right of way the crosshatched property the crosshatched area is the area of the right of way that the front loading driveways and the shared driveway um, take up, I guess. And in and one of the things that was so is so challenging for us is that in front of these front loaders, you know, there's no access for drive for parking on the street. And more importantly, there's an interruption of the pedestrian realm. So, you know, it's an interruption of um, walkability for every driveway, um, four for the one on the left, only one on the one on the right. And also there's an interruption in the storm sewer system. So if you've got an open ditch system, you know, these the open ditches are not as effective and don't and aren't able to carry as much water um, on the drawing on the left as they are on the right. So all of this is what really fed to um, the, 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 the overall conversation about these types of developments and and reducing the what we believed were onerous requirements for shared driveways. So. Thank All you. right. Thank you, Margaret. Uh, committee members, anyone else? Questions, comments? I'm not seeing any hand raised, but um, mm -hmm. I wanted to personally thank you, Margaret, and your team for doing something, finding, you know, presenting something that seems so obvious, which is like genius, because I was like, I could have done that, but it's so clean, it's so simple, it's elegant in the presentation, and it makes perfect sense that now we have, we've leveled the playing field. And now developers have more than a single option, which is truly available to them and affordable, not just one. So good work. Congratulations to you and your team. Thank you. All right. So now is that the end of the director's meeting? Oh, is yeah, there... that, that concludes the director's um, report. Thank you. Thank you, of course. All right. So we will now go over to Savita, who will discuss today's agenda. Savita. Yes, sir. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. <clears throat> so on the agenda today, we have um, we are going to discuss some preliminary ideas for front loading um, properties and also for small lot developments. Before we get to the ideas, I um, let's shed some light on how we got here and the current challenges that we need to address. Um, before anything, the first thing, next slide please. The first thing I want to talk about is, um, sorry, um, next. Next. Yes, thank you. So the definition of single family, like you have seen this slide before, all of you and most of you, 
um, one property, one lot with one unit or one lot with the duplex is considered single family. <clears throat> so is a, um, a lot with one main unit and a detached secondary unit of no larger than 900 square feet is also considered single family. And then um, two structures and two individual lots that are joined together by a party wall in between that is also uh, qualify that also qualifies under the single family definition. Next slide, please. So these three developments that you have seen the styles of developments. Uh, this is an aerial image of the same. Um, how they look from the aerial image um, with different types of developments that qualify under single family. Next slide, please. <clears throat> So when original subdivisions were planned about 50 or more years ago, the typical lot width was about 50 to 60 lots. Mostly homes were built with detached garages in the back or cars were parked in the side yard. Generally, the driveways were narrow and majority of the property frontage had the home facing the street with porches. Carports were also used, but front loading garages were not as common as they are today. This type of traditional development helps with eyes on the street and makes the streets more pedestrian friendly for all users. The interactions, informal interactions while on the porch or on the sidewalk create a community feel and neighbors would know each other. As you can see in this image, what I'm trying to show here um, in this image is to say that the traditional homes um, one or two lots in between got subdivided into this um, the model of 1017 where the building is set, is set back 10 feet, but the garage is set back 17 feet. Um, and that provided and helped with the density. That was um, the intended reasoning of having this portion in the ordinance. Um, and but slowly and steadily as these developments came in, as you can see the entire block phase in this last image um, to the right, the lower uh, right image, you can see that the entire block phase is all um, the narrow front loading lots. And that is when it becomes. Savita, can I can I interrupt you for just one moment? We have some mm -hmm. of the members um, of our committee. Mike Disberger says he can't see the slides. Can can you see them now, Mike? Because I can see no, them. You're on slide number one, and some other people in the chat are saying the same thing. Ron says meeting agenda is all we're on. There we go. Now I got it. There okay. Go. That's interesting. So okay. now you're good, Mike? Good you're now. On a, now I see it. There's, yes. there's four photographs. Okay. Yes, all five, right. four photographs. Thank you. Thank you, Savita. OK, great. I think there may be some streaming issues, um, so we'll go slow. Thank you for letting us know. If you see any other problems also, please point it out. Um, so basically on this slide, we are trying to show how the neighborhoods are slowly transitioning into these uh, narrow front loading lots. Um, because the regulations allow for the lots to be as narrow as 20 feet, properties are being subdivided to be as narrow as possible. To still meet the requirement of two parking spaces per single family unit, the entire frontage is being used for the garage with two car, um, two bay car driveways. Because the residential driveways are allowed to be a maximum of 24 feet per IDM, there is no minimum distance required between the driveways on adjacent properties. Um, continuous developments of such narrow front loading lots take up the entire pedestrian rail, making the streets inaccessible for other users and the street infrastructure is compromised. Next slide, please. So here I'm trying to show the performance standards of the 1017 building line. What you see in the white image is the plan view and the cross section. This is portion of the ordinance that I just clipped and put it here to show um, what a 1017 diagram means. So in this image, what you see in the yellow portion, that's the portion of the structure that can come up to the 10 feet building line. And the garage is supposed to be set back 17 feet like you see the, the hash portion. That's the, the seven feet. The upper floors above 
the second story and up, they can overhang into that hashed portion. And that's what the cross section is trying to depict. Um, the intent of the 1017 building line was to foster a design framework applicable to the city and to assure that the pedestrian use of sidewalks is not impeded by vehicles blocking the sidewalks. So when originally this was created in 1999, the focus was to bring in the density and to make sure that the garages and back then they used to be built at 10 feet. So the intent was to push the garages back and uh, bring the buildings to the front and make sure there is no uh, impediments or obstructions to the sidewalk. Um, and these developments did bring the density that this um, model was trying to bring. The lot typical diagram shows that portion of the structure that fronts the street and the 17 feet building line. Due to the narrow lots, so the, the upper image that you see is showing how the narrow lots get developed. The intent was really to actually have the frontage and then the garage. So right next to the white image, you see um, the image that shows how house with one car. So the portion, this is what the intent was for 50 feet lots. If they develop with such uh, 1017 design, that is was the anticipation. But as the lots got narrower and the width of the lot can be as small as 20 feet, the result became what you see in the upper image is. Um, there is no appearance of the front door and the garages are. Um, the, the structure is only overhanging above and there is no structure that comes to the front. Um, it is apparent that by looking at this, the, the cars are blocking the sidewalk still, so that is a concern and there is no appearance of the front door or there is no structure to the front. And um, the intent of the ordinance in that sense is not being met. Here is an um, next slide, please. In this slide, you can see the before and after image of how the one single family lot got subdivided into two lots. And these were all built in uh, meeting the current regulation. So I want to acknowledge um, that portion. It's not that they're not meeting the ordinance. They are complying with ordinance requirements and uh, rightfully so they have some merits and I'm going to talk about that in a minute. Um, next slide, please. I do want to make a note that these developments comply with the current regulations uh, brought in the density they were intended for the development pattern and has merits like, for example, um, two additional parking spaces in the driveway besides the two in the garage. The backyard space um, is available, which is um, a requirement for some of the home buyers and um, no need for common access agreement, uh, unlike the shared driveways. So if someone um, intends to do a shared driveway, there is a common access agreement that needs to happen because they're sharing the access and there is no need for that in this these types of developments. So those are some of the merits um, that I wanted to mention. However, as the city is now focusing on multimodality, walkability, along with density, there is a need to revisit our regulations to make sure all these goals are met. I feel like I've talked to I hear someone. Is there any issue with the presentation? Everything's fine. I think it was someone who didn't meet themselves. OK, sorry about that. Um, next slide, please. In this slide, what I'm trying to show are the elements that contribute to safety for all road users and create a walkable pedestrian realm. Um, so what I'm trying to note here is what are the things that we should be looking out for when we talk about density and also talk about um, walkability and being pedestrian friendly development. Um, front doors facing the street, the ground story um, windows, porches in the front, walkways that um, connect the front doors to the, uh, the pedestrian that connect to the sidewalk, um, front yards, sidewalks, 
there is a safety buffer between the sidewalk and the driving lanes. The tree lawns, space for trees to grow and street trees themselves and the on street parking. So these are all factors that make the streets more friendlier and safer. Um, and these are the elements of good design. Next slide, please. So looking at the development pattern in the city and recognizing that the intent of the ordinance is not being met when developing on narrow lots, Planning Commission has recommended that the Planning de Department look at the ordinance to rectify these unintended consequences. So here you can see that how there is a challenge um, when these front loaders develop. Um, there is challenge, especially on narrow streets or open ditch streets. Um, and that's what these images are trying to show and how the pedestrian um, the sidewalks, uh, cars are blocking the sidewalks. So some of the content to remember. Next slide, please. Um, so the charge of the committee is to guide staff in achieving the goals of walkability and as well as density with an understanding of the challenges while considering the development patterns. Next slide, please. I just wanted to point out the challenges here, so it's almost like a recap from the images is um, street frontage with no porches, lawns or visible entry doors. Long stretches of subdivided lots with driveways um, along the block. Too much concrete areas along the public street. Pedestrian connections to sidewalks are not provided in some instances. Um, Parked vehicles in the driveways often block the sidewalk. Because of the continuous driveways on street parking is eliminated. Difficulty meeting landscape requirements. Um, street trees, they don't have much room to grow. Problems in providing standard and regulated services, for example, the solid waste services. Um, streetscape looks more like um, an alley than a street right of way and the character of the street or the neighborhood changes. So those are some of the things, the challenges that we want to address um, while we look at any kind of amendments to the ordinance. Next slide, please. Though the most efficient way to develop a narrow mid block property may be by front loading the lots, it must be done in such a way to promote the intent of the ordinance and make the street safe for, for all users. So in this image, I'm trying to uh, show some examples of attempts to reduce the impact to the streets. For example, the leftmost top image is of single car garages. Um, to the right of that, you see um, a common drive that provides access to two lots. This is actually a flag lot design. Um, the image to the left bottom, it's um, showing an image where the driveway apron is narrower, but then as it enters the property, the driveway apron flares up to provide the two car garage uh, access to the two car garage. And the um, bottom rightmost image is showing how one driveway apron is serving two properties. So these are all different ideas that were used, um, even though voluntary, some of them are voluntary, not required, but they chose to do it this way. Um, so I just wanted to acknowledge that there are some opportunities that we can explore. Next slide, please. So we asked ourselves, how do we continue to build on front loading lots while reducing the, uh, the negative effects? So in looking at that, we um, already have some options in the ordinance. Um, and then some other ideas we want to discuss with you today. So the flag lot option, like I mentioned before, is already available in the ordinance. However, there are minor tweak, tweaks that we want to make. Um, where we want if we are able to change the ordinance to say that the 
lots that do flag lots, both the lots are required to share the access. That will be a nice change. And um, suggest flag lots for mid block subdivisions. If there is a possibility somebody wants to do just a 50 by 100 subdivision, there is an opportunity for um, the flag lot. So if you are able to suggest that, I think that's uh, one of the solutions. The next option is to do shared driveways, and this um, is like an extension of the flag lots. Generally, flag lots is done for two to four lots where the access is shared between the properties. But when it comes to shared driveway, it has an opportunity to provide um, access for more lots than that. Um, we do want to make some adjustments, and one of the things was like our director mentioned in the beginning, to adjust the detention rules, so we are already successful with that. Um, and soon it will become real and be part of the ordinance. Um, and then the next step is to address inconsistencies between Chapter 42 and IDM. I can show if anyone is interested, show examples of certain things. Some of you may already know how uh, there are some requirements that chapter 42 has which contradicts with IDM. Um, so we are working with Public Works and I want to take this opportunity to acknowledge our Public Works team, um, really thank them for their time um, and guidance in this process and they are willing to work with us and they had provided solutions of how we can eliminate those inconsistencies. So that is happening already. Um, and there will be some minor changes with respect to that. Um, require shared driveway in some instances. I'm going to show you examples for this uh, in a minute after this slide. Um, in some instances, when it is corner lots or when the property is wide enough to accommodate a shared driveway, it would be nice to have uh, to require a shared driveway instead of front loading lots, and that is one of the points of discussion today. Coming to the alley access um, committee, all of you have guided us before is that work with Public Works on um, allowing alley access and to make the process simpler um, when properties decide to take alley access. Um, we have started the discussion and we will continue to work with Public Works on simplifying the process. But this proposal here is to come with an understanding that we will achieve success in um, allowing access off of the alley. So in anticipation, we want to make sure that we require alley access in some situations where it's possible. And the last one is other ideas. So this is the major portion of our discussion today. Um, ideas like one car garages, tandem garages, common driveway cut, like the example I showed, homes, um, require that certain portion of the home on the street, uh, home fronts on the street, um, establish a minimum width for front loading um, lots where the garages are in the front, reduce parking requirements if somebody is proposing smaller units, reduce parking um, close to transit, and establish narrow driveways or minimum distance between driveways. So these are different ideas that we came up with, and we want to know if there is anything that we're missing, which also could be added to this variety of ideas. I'm going to pause here and let you ask any questions you may have. I still have a um, few slides after this, but I want to give you an opportunity to see um, if you have any thoughts before we move on. Thank you, Savita. Commissioner, uh, I'm sorry, commissioners, committee members, uh, questions and comments. I see my sh Mike Dishberger's hand up. Mike? <clears throat> I'll wait, I'll, uh, I will, on some of the things I'll comment later. You're throwing a lot of information out here. Um, you're, you're saying the original intent of Chapter 42 was a lot of things. We took that, we're trying to take that as fact. I'm not sure all those things you listed on there were facts at the time. I was part of those meetings. Um, we were trying actually why the lots got down to 20 or even in some cases 15 feet is that um, you were trying to get more density in Houston, a lot more density. We didn't have it. Um, 
some of your ideas, the go, hey, the ideas on the flag, make some tweaks in the flag lots. That's good. The detention is fantastic, by the way, Margaret. Thanks for getting that done. That should have been done a long time ago. I'm, I'm thank you for doing that. That's that's going to help get more shared drawways, which I think you're trying to push here. Um, I want to talk about this alley stuff. Um, alleys cannot be built in Houston, Texas. Um, the city of Houston Public Works Department Engineering, and really I'm going to say Storm. They make it so difficult. You have to pretty much rebuild the alleyways to use them. I own nine lots in the Heights. And I told Savita this. I would have loved to use those alleyways. The alleyways are actually partially paved, but I was told, no, you have to put in all this storm and detention form. So the heck with that. I put in front loaders. That was stupid. In the, in, in the Heights, there's three approved city maintained blocks in the Heights, a neighborhood known for alleyways. They're both on 20, uh, 21st Street and uh, 20th Street, three city blocks in all of the Heights. So if the city of Houston would come and say, we'll, we'll do all this work, we would build alleyway homes all day long. People love them. You have uh, the extra 80 you were talking about in previous meetings, but the cost and time period to get alleyways done is nearly impossible. I don't think a permit has been issued in three years. I'm on a separate committee that goes over these things. Nobody's got an alley permit. They used to be easy. Now it's impossible because of the detention and the storm requirements on it. And you end up having to rebuild the entire alleyway from your house to the corner. So if, if public works could push back and change the IDM manuals in a lot of places, it's not just, it's like alleyway or uh, IDM, it's the um, chapter nine and a bunch of others. That would go a long way because there are a lot of out, there's alleyways in Sunset Heights that you can't can't do but the ones in the heights are i mean that's crazy so um and as far as the other ideas we can talk about that later i just uh, i wanted to at least mention the first three here that um uh, the alleyways people want to do alleyways no one we were stopped from doing it public works said no more that's pretty much put a, a moratorium for a year and a half on it then they said you can do them if you follow all these rules so anyway thank you mr chairman this is director wallace brown can i jump in on that please do margaret go ahead Mike, I could not agree with you more. I think building front loading garages when they back up to an alley, I agree with you that is a stupid, stupid, stupid thing we require. And I got to say, I'm feeling a little emboldened about this um, success we've had on the IDM. And we're, we're, we're working with Public Works. We're going to, we, the city, are going to fix this problem. I, yeah, I know you are. It's, this would be so great to do because yeah. the we need to fix this problem. alleyways. It does. <laughs> Well, it's not just the heights. I mean, there's there actually are alleys in, in yes, many there other are, areas of Houston. City, actually, I've, I've and, mentioned an area that everyone thinks of alleyways. <laughs> yeah, so I totally, totally agree with you, and it is on my list of things to fix. All right, thank you, thank you, Mike, thank you, Margaret. Um, I see Curtis Davis' hand up. Mr. Davis, are you there? Sure. Uh, Go right ahead, sir. Thank you, Mike, for um, having that rant. That was the clearest rant I've heard in a long time, and it was very, um, very helpful. Um, I, this is a recommendation or a recommendation for staff to consider. Um, because of some of the complexity with some of these issues, yet the consensus on many of these issues, um, particularly when we talk about alleyways and we talk about parking and the implications of parking on sites, mo many of the, the, the lots are fairly straightforward and resolvable, but I would argue that there are many, many opportunities that because of their complexity require a level of design review that the structure that we have just doesn't allow. And, and I'm understanding from many contractors uh, and builders these days that even the building permitting process is problematic. And when you couple with it, the escalating price of materials, it becomes almost an indeterminate exercise to determine how much a, uh, a unit is gonna cost within the context of a year horizon. Is it, I, I know the city has recently considered contracting um, plan review services through third party uh, entities. Is it possible for the planning department to get with the building department and public works and others to consider a, a plan review option that would be supported through consultancy 
to get through some of these complex issues that are hard to codify and be effective for everyone and uh, that could facilitate uh, more effective designs that don't necessarily fit within um, a simple uh, codification that we could develop through this process. And, and, I, and I know that it can be problematic to do such things, but I have been in different jurisdictions when because of different kinds of pressures, um, third party review teams have been put together uh, to address specific sets of issues that facilitate construction and allow for comprehensive thorough review to meet the goals of the city and at the same time um, do it in a timely manner. Um. I would request our director to comment on that. It's definitely a great idea, but I don't know the scope. Um, so director, would you please comment on it? Yeah, so. Um, so first of all, I'm, I'm not sure I understood your first comment because I thought what you suggested was doing a consultancy to, to develop what the. Design rules might be and in and I'm. That's what we're doing here. So I wasn't sure if that's really what you meant or if you meant. At the permitting stage based on rules changes that this committee might recommend more, more the latter. OK, that, that, that as we get the objectives developed here, it's clear that they're going to be odd conditions and that a project if the if the developer or the proponent of the project opts in, I wouldn't make it a requirement, make it an opt in that there would be an expedited review process with a third party um, reviewer who's ver well versed in these issues and could um, and who's empowered to facilitate um, the development of projects that would meet many of the objectives that we're um, discussing. Um, yeah, so our teams have various expertise among them and that's who get assigned certain types of, of reviews. Um, for instance, we've got a team that is specifically really well trained in walkable places and TOD reviews. And and I think that's what you're talking about, but can it can it be improved? Absolutely. I, does it need do we need to hire a consultant to do it for the planning aspect of it? I don't I don't know, but I'd like to look into it. So I guess my answer is I don't have an answer right now, but thanks for the suggestion and we'll look into it. Um. Thank you, Margaret. Let me ask a question before we go forward. Uh, so, Mr. Davis, are are you saying a group that would would look into these things outside of the current ordinances, Chapter 42, so on and so forth, and make a decision? Or because we already have it within the ordinances, do you mean in addition to or outside the ordinance? Well, not so much outside the audience or ordinance, but where there are areas where exceptions are to be granted for certain purposes that that review could facilitate the approval of that exception being granted. Um, I, when I was doing work in DC a number of years ago and we had a number of projects that had complex fire reviews, you know, atriums. <laughs> I think many of us have built this stuff, the, the problems with atriums. And the there was a backlog, a big backlog in the city of getting projects through and review. So a third party reviewer was retained for those projects with specific expertise in these issues and where the subtleties of exemptions could be granted um, around the very, you know, because it's so hard to codify that stuff, um, they were empowered to make those recommendations. The final approval still resided with uh, city staff, but it expedited the process. And on these smaller projects, up to say 24, 50 units, um, there may be a way of thinking about this that says um, there may be areas that can allow exemptions, but they're going to need some careful review, but that needs to happen uh, in an expedited manner. And and I'm just, and, and I know staff is kind of stretched thin and we ask staff to do everything all the time. <clears throat> and this might be a way to uh, free up staff to think more strategically around these things and have these tactical responses done through consultants. OK, thank yeah. you. Interesting idea. Thank you. Mr. Chair, thank you. this is Neil Dykeman. When uh, can you put me in the queue, please? I'm on phone, cannot see the hand raise. 
OK, thank you. Uh, uh, Neil, I'll call you uh, momentarily. I see uh, Tyron McDaniel. Mr. McDaniel, are you there? I thought you had your hand raised, sir. OK, uh, Mr. Dykeman, go right ahead, sir. So I, I'd like to you know, echo and expand on the comments about the both the alleys and the expedited process. I, I think, number one, this is a good idea yeah, that staff should be working on. Um, yeah, but it is obviously going to take some iterations to get a proposal that will make sense. Yeah, the, uh, the ability to utilize alley facing yeah, um, uh, infrastructure yeah, is, is just a, a huge win win. Um, but the it, nothing will happen in a positive manner until the city gets yeah, its alley issues under control, i.e. who owns them, how are they permitted, not treat them like streets and that sort of thing. Otherwise, you just can't functionally get it done. And I think the, the opportunity is to consider with public works of how you can treat the alleys as something that's not a street and not a private drive, something in the middle that allows yeah, the, um, uh, allow, allows the, the work to get, to get done. Um, and then I think the, yeah, the idea of some sort of an exemption process yeah, or a shortened or expedited process that treats the, yeah, a project that does not have a driveway on the street front um, as uh, differently, whether that is changing setbacks, stream, expedited streamlined review, simplified yeah, traffic, something that made it a, a positive for the incentive for the developer on that particular project to move, to move forward. Um, yeah, and ideally uh, create, create a streamline uh, for time, I think would be, would be the best way to approach this. And it wouldn't need to be for all projects if you can create basically an easy button that allows one to build faster rear facing than you can front facing. I think we would see a lot of a very positive impacts very, very, very quickly. Um, to, I, I visited a business the other day that, yeah, um, that uh, is basically building houses this side in eight weeks from start to finish in factory. Yeah, it should not take us six to 12 months to build a house in Houston. Yeah, um, that's the problem we're attacking here and figuring out how to attack it yeah, makes a, a lot of sense. And if we can get the traffic off the main streets and on the alleys, the infrastructure extension will be a win-win for both residents as well as developers, as well as the, the overall city yeah, um, infrastructure challenges. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chair, we cannot hear you. You muted. Right. Sorry. Apologies. I said thank you, Neil. Um, I don't see any other hands raised. Is there anyone else who wanted on the subcommittee who wanted to comment on the information Tyron, you've seen so far? Tyron McDaniel has his hand raised again. Yes, Mr. McDaniel, go ahead, please. We cannot hear you, sir. Um, Tyron, can't hear you. Star six. I uh, can't hear you, sir. Please use the unmute button on the screen. Tyron. I think Tyron's on the phone. I'm not 100% sure. Star six to unmute. Any he luck? Coming back. OK. Well, mm -hmm. I'll tell you what, we're going to go on with the presentation, Tyron, but um, you know what? Just wait for it. Hello. Ah, Tyron, Hi. is that you? Yes, sir. We've got okay, you. Great. All right. So first, Tom McDaniel's it, in attendance. Congratulations. It is a miracle. Please talk quickly in case we lose you. Very much so. No, thank you. I appreciate it. And and I too, you know, I take my hand down inadvertently, but I echo many of the sentiments that have already been said. We have a property right now in Fifth Ward where um, because of the alley restrictions, it's a property that already has an alley in front of our house, in front of our lot, excuse me. Um, there's alley, but the lots that are adjoining us, uh, the street hasn't been completed or whatever the case may be. And so um, we're just apprehensive about how to move forward because of the issues that it relates to alley access. And so uh, fundamentally, none of our projects tend to have the driveways uh, because we sacrifice having um, two front facing units with figuring out a way to kind of take some of that alley that some of what we're addressing here in terms of having these um, driveways that face the street. So I'm all for options and solutions that will allow us to uh, create, make alleyways uh, easier to get approved, as well as for us to provide um, different housing solutions uh, from an access perspective. So um, 
this is all sentiments that other people express. So I echo those and 100% are behind those. Thank you, Tyron. I appreciate that. OK, um, Peter Friedman, Mr. Friedman. I, I want to say thank you again for the work on the common driveways. That's, that's an excellent thing. And I, I want to make sure that uh, I, I mention that again. I, I'm really I'm really happy with that. Um, the, the only thing I'm, I'm seeing on here that we're not really discussing is the idea of uh, mandatory parking on a lot. Um, if you're trying to stop driveways or multiple driveways and street cuts in, in a combined area, then a possibility of not requiring on lot parking might be an alternative. Obviously, that would impact street parking, but if you could count street parking towards the uh, towards that requirement, I think that would be something that should at least be looked at. I don't know if it's a good solution or not, but I think it's something that should be um, just uh, maybe maybe looked at as an alternative uh, idea than than if if you are to make minimum minimum driveway width requirements. All right, thank you. Um, Mr. Chair, may I? Yes, yes, please. Oh, thank you. Um, Mr. Friedman, um, that's an idea. So one of the ideas was to reduce the parking requirements for um, units that are smaller and also for units that no parking minimums for properties along transit uh, or uh, transit served uh, streets. Um, so those are the ideas. Um, thank you for bringing it up. Um, Chair, if there are no other questions, can I move on in the presentation? Uh, actually, Savita, I've got two more speakers, just very okay, quickly. Sure. Uh, um, Zayn Escobar, are you there? Yes, yes. Go ahead, uh, please. I'll keep it very brief. Um, I just wanted to say that I am excited to see movement on the alley um, options because in Freedman's Town specifically, that would help us with some of the fact that we have narrow streets, so we don't have a way to increase street parking, um, additional parking on the street is, is difficult. We're trying to eliminate uh, additional curb cuts, so this would help solve that problem in many ways in future development. Um, also, this is a question that um, is just my lack of knowledge of some of the nuances of alley regulation, but I've had the experience in California of them using alleys and having overflow parking in the alley. So you essentially have an oversized alleyway um, that allows people to park additional cars in there. It's sometimes like it's like a hammerhead. And so you would essentially get a couple of extra parking spots for guests and things like that. Um, and so I was wondering how that would fit into any future regulation. Um, again, talking about these parking minimums and things like that, that might be one way to do a two for one, get some parking, get people off the streets and then have private access um, for traffic flow in tight areas like like ours. And uh, I'll I'll mute myself. Uh, thank you. Um, Savita, before we go on, let me let me call. I've got uh, Jeffrey Kaplan and Mike Dishberger. Uh, Mr. Kaplan, go ahead, please. Thank you. Can you all can hear me, right? Yes, go ahead. So th this is an idea that um, one of my my business business partners um, had thrown out and we've been bra brainstorming for years. My partner, Monty Large, um, and I am merchant, retail entrepreneurs, and, and we do inner city development largely in transit corridors. And there's just, there are so many existing townhomes that are front loading. Um, and, you know, I'm, you know I'm, I'm also hopeful that we are going to move away from, from townhome density to, you know, a more stacked flat model in the future as land prices become higher. But one solution with the existing stock of townhomes to encourage more proximity between um, people's residence and, and their shops is to create some sort of incentive for, for micro um, re retail spaces or office spaces or even small studio spaces with um, parking incentives to basically turn existing garages into storefronts to eliminate head-in parking. Um, it's, it's an idea that I haven't heard of in another city, but Houston has a specific um, <laughs> a high amount of supply of townhomes in the last decade and a half, two decades. So it's an idea that I, I threw out to, to um, Savita yesterday, and I'm just going to throw out, and you all might think it's the most terrible idea ever, but the idea is to, to cluster hyper-local and micro spaces for commercial use to basically turn townhomes into 
you know, small mixed use projects. All right, thank you. Um, Mike Dishberger is next. Mike? Yes, I wanted to come back around. I'm, I don't want to pass up this slide on the other ideas. I guess I want to just make a, a point about the front letters. I do build a lot of front letters. I've done some shared driveways. So I've done all styles. You've shown pictures of my house here today and in the past. Um, we don't, what I want to make sure is that the rules that we have are not going to ban front loaders by making them so onerous and driveways being too small or the garages can't have to be a certain size that you cannot have them. Uh, there's a reason why we build the front loaders and, and not as many shared driveways. First of all, the shared driveways have been more difficult to build as the rules have increased, but buyers want the front loaders. We Builders don't build what people don't want. We can't force things onto someone. If we, you know, we don't use vinyl siding in Houston, but we can't force them to use vinyl siding on our houses. They won't buy them. Um, but when we build the front loaders, they have two parking places, a two car garage and two parking places. If you eliminate the front loaders on say on a 50 foot wide lot, I'm taking away four parking places to gain one on street. And I, I do hear a lot of comments about two things. One, some of the pictures by the way, are showing the old chapter 42 with the 10 foot garage setback. That's an unfair picture to show cars going across the sidewalks. There were some of those today. But the other thing is on the uh, going across the driveways, easy solution, it's against the law. Why don't, you, why don't we call the police, go out there and hit street by street and that'll go away. But the other thing is we build in all these neighborhoods. I live on neighborhoods with narrow streets. People who have these quote unquote parking places in front of the yards put big rocks there. They put posts, they put no parking signs, cones, and if they can't succeed with that, then they get the city to put no parking signs on one side of the street. So a lot of the neighborhoods that were quoting today, Shady Acres, Cottage Grove, Rice Military, go drive those streets. You'll see no parking signs on half the side. On the other side, you'll see rocks and things. It, people, it sounds great in theory, but hey, the homes we build are going to allow people to park and not have to park on the street with the parking they have. So just wanted to bring that up as we finish this. All right, thank you, Mike. Um, I do not see any other hands raised from committee members. Anyone else have commentary before we move forward? All right, hearing none, I'll turn this back over to Savita. Yes, thank you, Chair, and I acknowledge all of the comments and thank you for sharing your thoughts. Um, these the next few slides will be really quick is to show examples of the inconsistencies or the, or the issues, little issues that we would like to handle and are working with Public Works. Um, this is an example of a flag lot where it would be nice to require that the, the drive be uh, providing access to both the lots instead of just to one lot. Um, so that will be something we want to uh, change. Here is an example of um, the front loading lots that were identified and how these could be um, done differently. Um, with flag lot design is what this image is trying to show. Essentially, we can achieve the same result of uh, how many other units the development was proposing with the shared um, with the flag lot concept. Next slide, please. In this slide, um, we, I'm trying to identify the inconsistencies I mentioned between Chapter 42 and IDM. Uh, the first one, um, Shared driveway is considered as a commercial drive instead of a residential drive, and therefore the minimum distance from the intersection IDM suggests that it be um, 60 feet, and that creates challenges when somebody is wanting to develop a shared driveway. So we're working with Public Works on that, um, and the flaring of 16 feet shared driveway to 18 feet because a commercial driveway cannot be 16 feet. So that has been a change that. Also, we are working with um, public works to fix. Um, the third one, uh, sorry, the second image is showing that the four feet offset required with shared driveways has to be a tangential of 20 feet is a requirement in IDM, and we want to mirror that into Chapter 42. The last one is about the guest parking requirement that uh, one space for every six units, um, the guest parking space and shared driveway developments. When it is in the front, it creates a challenge for somebody to from the street to enter uh, the parking space and maneuvering challenges. So it has been suggested that we move them to back uh, a little bit, at least one lot back. 
and that is something that we are working on with public works as well. So these are some minor stuff that um, is already happening. Next slide, please. And here is an example of a situation where um, this development, the, the first one, is proposing front loaders of six lots, and it's at the intersection. Um, the same development style can be achieved without any change, except the if, if there is a shared driveway in the back, then um, the garages can be in the back, and um, we can think about a reduced building line um, in carbon gutter streets, um, maybe up to five feet because they're doing, actually five feet is allowed if you do shared driveway. So yes, um, shared driveway can be done and the development can still happen. The second example is an example where, uh, again, property at the intersection, this property in a 1017 model only gets five lots, but in a shared driveway model, it gets six lots. Um, mm -hmm with the 16 feet shared driveway. So these are some ideas of uh, situations where uh, it will be nice to have an opportunity to require shared driveway, which we don't have in the ordinance today. So um, next slide. Yes, this slide is also similar example where the shared driveway can go in the back of this property. This property has streets on three sides. But then by doing 1017s, two sides of the streets are um, all driveways. And we would like to propose that uh, or uh, discuss today that if we can require shared driveway in a situation like this, that will be helpful um, and it will not impact the kind of development that happens. Um, Next example is a very unique. Sorry, go back to the slide, please. The right side example is very unique. The um, property owner proposed a shared driveway. However, the front loads, are, front lots are still front loading. And I think if we are able to require them to um, rear load, that will be very efficient use of the, the concept and also the public streets. Um, will be much better with on street parking and they can provide a much better development. Next slide, please. This is an alley example and we had good discussion on alleys uh, in this situation because of the challenges with uh, alleys. Uh, the property was developed with front loaders, but this is what we are already we started discussion on and we um, expect that we will have positive results. Next slide, please. OK, so I am going back to that. Um, the slide where you saw the four things the, I'm just this is listing down the same things from the other ideas that we want to discuss today. And um, so committee members, I want to ask um, each one of them and you can you can respond to which one of those are good ideas, but the ideas are um, should we consider requiring tandem parking if we absolutely think that two car garages is a necessity, which I do not think, but um, that's an option. Or we can propose that for narrow lots, uh, we require one car garages and the second car be um, on the driveway. Shared driveway cuts is also an option where um, the driveway straddles between the two properties and provides access to both properties. That way, instead of two driveways, it's we still have only one driveway. Um, requiring a certain portion of the home to front the street is also an option. Um, um, reduce building lines for properties that take rear access. Um, I also request a committee's opinion on how wide should the residential driveways be? Can we work with narrow um, driveways that flare up within the property? Um, should we establish a minimum distance between the residential driveways to make sure there is enough space between driveways for on-street parking to happen? Um, 
definitely reduce parking requirements for small units. That is one of the points uh, one of the committee members brought up. I think that's a great idea, but how small? Um, 1,000, 1,500, what should be the size of the small unit for it to get reduced parking uh, requirement? Um, no parking minimums near transit. This is the overall concept when there is proximity to, let's say, high frequency bus routes, rail, there is bike paths, bike, uh, bike share facilities, park and rides, any kind of other modes of transit proximity. I think we should consider uh, not having minimums. That does not mean that the development shouldn't provide any parking or don't have to, but basically city will not establish a minimum. That's the concept. Um, and lastly, should we think about increasing the garage building lines from 17 feet to something else, maybe 20 feet? Because a lot of 1017 developments that we have seen, um, the garages, uh, sorry, the cars are still blocking the sidewalks. Um, which definitely is not the intent of the 1017 regulation. Um, next slide, please. I'll go back to the question slides in a minute where all these questions are listed. But um, here is an example of a development that could. Um, a two. One lot being subdivided with three lots could very well do a shared driveway and this is how the bottom image shows how um, it may look. Next slide, please. And here is what I meant when I said common drive. So the one driveway provides and these driveways could be wider than 12 feet. They probably can be 16 feet or something to make sure it's eight feet on either side. So. I hope there may not be any access agreement. Um, because that is one of the concerns is about having an agreement and this gives enough room for on street parking to happen. So this is something that I was thinking about could be a solution. Next slide, please. And here are the questions for the committee. So I'm going to stop here and I'm going to sink in everything that you're going to give me in terms of ideas. All so right. I'm opening the floor for questions. All right, thank you, Savita. I've got some hands raised, so we'll start uh, with Scott Kubler. Scott, are you there? Scott? Yes, sir. Thank there you. you are. We hear you. Go ahead, please. So, Savita, what I heard from your briefing is that um, we're actually looking at on street parking as a positive. Is that what you intended to communicate? On street parking is an opportunity for people to park if they have to, but it is not an alternative for somebody to not park on the, um, within the property. So it's not like don't provide parking within the property, do it on street, but it is an opportunity for somebody to have that open anybody, not just the property owner. So again, I, I, I attend this subcommittee meeting as a representative of the Super Neighborhood Alliance. And the Alliance tends to think that the on street parking is a terrible idea for our communities. And so it. It, it prevents the movement of traffic around our neighborhoods and it may cre just creates havoc for public works to solid ways to be able to to pick up our trash and the, the turnaround of the trucks and everything that goes along with it. And we are we're already in a situation where our our garbage and recycling and heavy trash doesn't get tend to get picked up on a regular time. So the idea of saying, well, we can do tandem parking with two cars in the driveway, but then the one slide that you showed <coughs> had a shared a drive where there wouldn't be any additional parking in the drive, which would then just shift all of the cars into the street. I certainly haven't lived in Houston as long as, as many of the rest of you have. Um, but the idea of eliminating parking altogether where you're close to a mass transit hub, um, again, to me, just it, it, it creates the environment for more street parking. 
we're not in favor of it. Um, and I, I think the idea of reducing that requirement is going to create more problems in, as the, the developers are going to save money by not allowing for it. And so I leave my comments there. Right, Thank thanks. you, Scott. Um, Mr. Chair, may I respond? Yes, please do. Um, Thank you so much for the comment. I just wanted to answer your question about the shared driveway. So in the example I showed um, shared driveway, each of them have two car garages already. So you're mentioning about on street parking. So for anybody who visits them, that's the situation where they probably will end up parking along the street um, and public streets for everybody. So it's possible that uh, the, the visitors are parking on the street. I do hear your concerns, especially on narrow um, streets. It can be a situation. In our discussions with Public Works, one of the point that um, was brought up by Public Works is that maybe to address the concern about solid waste, we can think about, um, and again, these are ideas that I'm discussing with you for guidance. So sure. um, one of the ideas was discussed is that maybe we can think about uh, establishing no parking signs on the trash days so that way some of those concerns can be addressed so it was an idea brought up and i wanted to share with you all so i i, I like the the idea um i spent 10 years in new york city and they would have opposite street parking twice a, a week uh to prevent that very situation from occurring um i have four children so the idea that the only people who are parking on the street is visitors is a absolutely not valid. And I'm not trying to attack you, ma'am. It's just my, it's one of those deals where a person with an experience isn't at the mercy of someone with a theory. I had six cars in my driveway at one point and being a, um, uh, trying to be a, a good neighbor, I put all six cars in my driveway and in my garage. And so every morning would be a shuffle as we would move cars in and out to be able to get people moving where they need to. Um, and I didn't park on the street, but that doesn't mean others are, are not going to. Um, this, the last part I would say is we have hard enough time trying to get, as we've had previous discussions, we've had hard enough time trying to get the law enforcement to, um, enforce the noise ordinances that we have problems in some of these areas to think that we're going to be able to put street parking up street signs up on opposite side of the the road and get the law enforcement to be able to enforce that from occurring I, i'm just not seeing it because our law enforcement is already stretched so again this is this is meant for discussion for uh, purposes of, of trying to come up with solutions i just the idea of pushing more cars into the street, I think, is a is a bad idea for us. All right, uh, thank, thank you. you. Mm -hmm. um, right. Can uh, I respond, please? Uh, the yes. One other yes. Um, living three different lives from where I transitioned from a student to a married person without kids, and then now with kids, I think there are different needs for the population. It's not a certain need that we're catering for. So the two car garages, you know, long driveway. I live in a cul-de-sac with a huge wide lot. So now I can have like 10 cars parked and it doesn't hurt. So um, versus when I was um, married with no kids, we used to live with one car uh, on the west side. And every day my husband would drop and I would come take the public transit. So there is a different spectrum of needs like students who want to live closer to the street or uh, persons who moved here and only are here for a few months. They want to live in a home where there is no need or they're not using car, they're using Uber or something. So we have to think about all of the different um, population and uh, more futuristic in terms of how the transition of demographics is happening. So those are all the thoughts that are going behind uh, when we talk about these ideas. So just want to share that. I'm, I'm glad you did. And, and you make a great point, which is why we call them single family residences, not single residences. OK, thank you. Um, our next speaker is uh, Tyron McDaniel. Tyron. Yes, uh, um, can you hear me? Yes, sir. You're good. Go ahead. Um, 
a couple of points, you know, specifically for the questions for the committee. One of the things that's passionate to my heart uh, as an affordable housing developer and builder is uh, really taking consideration for the reducing for the parking for smaller units. Um, you know, some of and it, it kind of segues into a point to be to make. You know, when you're building a city or developing a city or thinking about the planning, there's a there are a multiplicity of needs that you're going to have for people that are in these areas. And so um, what my business is built around supplying needs that are unconventionally met. And so to me to see that we're considering reducing parking for smaller units, I have a family member that moved here from Chicago, not having a vehicle. And it was funny to me because I referenced them. No, you're moving to Houston. You know, you don't have the in Chicago. You can it coexist without a, a car, but in Houston, that's a little bit differently. And 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 so I say that to say there are people that move to our city that are from other areas that have a sensibility of I don't need a vehicle if I'm living in a major city that should have access and transit and things of that nature with place to the type of housing that we're going to. No, it doesn't so, work. I can't dial. Um, and so for me, reducing the parking parking for smaller units is is something of uh, of interest to me because that's a market that we serve and um, we see a lot of people that utilize public transit in the houses that we provide. And so um, I just wanted to echo the sentiment to speak for those who may not be on the committee or be privy to these meetings to let everyone doesn't have two, three, four or five vehicles doesn't mean we should eliminate parking. We should have ample parking, but there are many people that live in Houston that don't have that they're single family or they're, you know, they're a single person or they're a family, but yet still they utilize public transportation. Thank you. All right, thank you. Uh, our next speaker is Mike Dishberger to be followed by Jeffrey Kaplan. Mike. Hi, um, uh, Mike Dishberger again. I uh, just want to go over a couple of these, these questions to the committee. Uh, the reason why we don't do all these shared driveways and people are doing two story homes is because they want the parking in the front and they want a yard in the back. They want some yard uh, to be in a beautiful drawings, but you had no yard. You have a five foot yard in the front behind a wrought iron fence. So you, all your neighbors, you drive by, you can't bark. You can like a barbecue in your front yard. There's no, there's no yard. There's no parking. And people don't want three stories. Pretty much everything you showed there, you will end up forcing three stories. So we're, what we're looking at with all, a lot of these ideas is pretty much a ban on front loaders, two stories. And let's move on to three stories crowded in on a shared driveway. As, as the man said, everybody's going to be parking on the street because there is no parking. You have to have an HOA. You have to have engineering done to develop the stuff per public works. Um, it just becomes crazy. Um, we've, we have talked about at our company doing one car garages or panhams. The homes are, in a lot of cases, are just too expensive. Two people, it takes two people nowadays to buy a house. They have two cars. We're Houston, Texas. We're not San Francisco or a city with mass transit like, like Chicago. And you need two cars. And I agree, this tandem, you'll have one car. And every morning, we'll have this game about who, whose car gets out of there first. Uh, cutting the width down on front-loading two-car garages is making it hard for people to get into the garages. Again, Public Works will not allow that probably anyway because they don't like people being able to back up into a ditch. And that's a lot of, unfortunately, our city is full of open ditches. And we're full of 50-foot wide lots. That's why all these things tend to fit 225 foot lots. There's 50 foot lot after one after another in the city. And uh, so the limiting the width of the driveways, even if you made it eight foot on each side, public works is gonna require an engineered development plan with sewers, waters, and all the stuff you don't have to do on a single family. It's just, and they're not gonna change that. And quite frankly, as a, as a builder, when public works makes a change, they have the right to change any minute they want. It's an IDM manual, which requires no vote of city council, no vote from the mayor. If, if the engineering group says we're changing it tomorrow, they do it. So I don't believe that. So I, I'm more for make it easier to build on shared driveways, make it give us all the tools in the toolbox, fix the alleyways. But most of these ideas on here all have to do with getting rid of front loading driveways. And I, again, I, See nothing wrong with them. As I drive my neighborhoods, there's a nice mix of homes. There's lots of shared driveways mixed with front loaders. And there are occasions you'll find a picture, I'm sure, where there's 10 
front letters in a row, but uh, that's not usually the case. There's a mix. You just go through Shady Acres. It's wow, wow, wow. This, it's, it's a little this, a little of that. And that's how it's always been. Uh, in fact, your first slides on your first presentation last year showed all these different styles of building in Houston. And that's true. Those are still all going on. So, again, I, I'm here to make sure we don't ban front loaders or make it impossible to build or live in those homes. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Mike. Uh, Jeff Kaplan. Yes. Jeff, are you there? Okay, can you hear me now? Yes, go ahead, please. That'd be great. So, so I think that, you know, I, I, I work on um, walkable urban infill development and transit corridors. And I, I have, I cannot tell you how many people and loved ones I have lost to Houston that would have stayed here if we had a couple of authentic walkable neighborhoods and front loading townhomes just absolutely kill the ability to have connected urbanism um, for many reasons. I mean, it, it's, it's besides being all about the car, it just makes, it makes the condition, you know, not feel like you're in a, in a, you know, a, a safe walking neighborhood. And, and I'm not saying, you know, there's some neighborhoods that are just, you know, they are what they are, but in a neighborhood where we've invested, you know, millions of dollars in, transit and we have policies that allow for transit oriented development and reduced parking which we're doing more of thankfully i think we we have this opportunity to really get innovative for new townhome product that's the product that is coming into those communities specifically and and i'm just so sure like that i'm just I, it's it's just i see it every day i see how you know yes there, there's a mixed bag of density there's neighborhoods that have townhomes and old homes but the trend is that you know a small home is is compromised today in a virgin in a booming neighborhood. We're also working on um, Houston's first and Texas's first co-housing community, which is is another you know solution for urbanism where the, the parking is sort of isolated from um, each unit. But it, but it requires you know accepting an alternative solution and, and moving a little bit further to get to your car. But I, I am, I am, I am sure that we're there. There is a market, and there's a supply and demand um, misalignment for for product that is catering to people that do want authentic urbanism and walkability, and it needs to be in these transit corridors. So I guess my 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 ask is that we do look at transit oriented develop the transit oriented um, specific code. Uh, first to solve the, the, the townhome issue because I, because I think we can figure out innovative solutions there first. And I'm not proposing that we take people's ability to drive away, but I think there's, there's just a big need for creating neighborhoods and walkable corridors that do appeal to people that don't want a front-loading townhome, a, a parking space in their townhome. All right. Um, thank you. Um, I show our next two speakers are Curtis Davis and Megan Sigler. So, Mr. Davis. Uh, thank you. Um, thank you, um, Savita, for putting together these alternatives. And um, as much as I uh, generally agree with uh, Scott and Mike um, on a lot of these issues and the challenges that the neighborhood organization space and <clears throat> the medium sized developer space in terms of the markets that they're dealing in, um, the city is under pressure to to make changes. And I and I think there is a balance that needs to be struck. I'm not quite sure where you draw the line, when, where, and how. That's why I made the recommendation that I made earlier about <clears throat> a review process that would allow for certain exceptions. But I do believe that we need to uh, think about this. Um, I'm not sure how many uh, people on this call are transit dependent, but more of us are becoming transit dependent. I know my wife teaches at HCC and um, uh, Yesterday, I had to take her to, you know, deal with the bus situation because of her car, and we both have used that to get into town from the west side of town. Um, so I, I think that the transit conditions are improving. The market for that is changing as people come in, and I, I, I cannot argue with Mike about the, the, the issues that he faces in, in, in dealing with the market that's in hand. Um, but that's not the whole market. And, and, and I think um, that 
the communities that are or have concerns through direct experience. I've got it in my neighborhood. A new neighbor pulled in and has a, <clears throat> a car business such that he's got a car transport trailer park, parked out in front of his house. <laughs> so we're having to deal wow. with it. And, um, but, you know, we're, we're seeing a lot of changes in the city that are very different from those, for those of us who've lived here for a long time. So I, I think as a committee, not only do we have to deal with the immediate pressures at hand, but we also have to look forward and be forward thinking um, beyond what our immediate experiences are and begin, you know, nobody would could figure out how to use an iPad until they made the damn thing and people started buying them. And you still have arguments about well, why do I need this? But gosh, if they fly off the shelves. And, and I, and I, and I think that, we have to think about housing solutions in in, in a manner that way. Um, we don't have very many um, people doing our uh, shared uh, types of development. Um, co-housing is not a big deal here, um, but uh, I've developed co-housing projects in other cities with the with the owners who put them together, and we'll see more of it here as time goes forward. And to be able to facilitate that type of development and have it expand into a, a less <clears throat> social market um, will occur. So uh, again, offering deference to Mike and Scott's point of view, I, I do think we need to uh, keep that in mind, but we also need to move forward and be forward thinking as to how we uh, apply policies that allow for greater density, fewer cars on the street, um, and um, at the end of the day, less parking. Thank you. All right, our next speaker is Megan Sigler. Megan, you there? I am. I, I kept right. changing. My, I kept changing my mind because much of what I wanted. To, <laughs> <laughs> That's much okay. of what I wanted to say has been said. Whatever. Um, but I think it's. I mean, I, I obviously I I hear Mike loud and clear, and um, it, it's about choices and market. And you know, I think that um, Peter has a whole. I can relate to what he's saying too, and some of the others when they're when they're building to, um, you know, to the to the low income that they might not have two cars, but um, it, it is that balance. And I know we we need to look ahead, but I also think we do need to remember really some of, and I think Mike touched on this why we did the ten seventeen because parking was needed for some of these units, um, and and to the policing point, we can't even get to the permit point, I guess. We can't even get, you know, people that are parking over the sidewalk, sidewalks consistently ticketed. So what what makes us think, you know, signs would work. Um, but the discussion's all great. I just think it is about alternatives and obviously what the market um, will bear. All right, thank you, Megan. Um, I don't have anyone else with their hand raised. Is there anyone else on the subcommittee who wanted, who had a comment? All right, hearing none, I, I'm just uh, going to remind you. I'm sorry. sorry. There's two hands that just popped up, Peter Friedman oh. and Sandy Stevens. All right, so uh, Sandy, we haven't heard from you. Go ahead, please. Sorry, Sandy? it took a minute to find how to unmute myself. Um, <laughs> You're right I ahead. Just, I just want to uh, second what Megan said. Um, I do think that this is, uh, it's a complex issue. Um, I, um, live on a street where I can look down my street and see front loading after front loading after front loading after front loading. They are quite popular. Um, I get that. Uh, but I do um, think it's time for us to look at alternatives because in those blocks where it's one right after another, there is no street parking to speak of. So um, I think it's important. Uh, but it is the market. What will the market bear? And the developers know that better than I do. So just wanted to Thank you. Uh, say, second what uh, Ms. Siegler said. Thank you. All right, uh, I show Peter Friedman with your hand up. Peter, go ahead. Yeah, so um, I, I wanted to mention something about the, uh, the market side. I, I agree that uh, we, you have to build to what the market wants. But right now we're experiencing such a huge inflation on home prices that 
I think we're going to have to have alternatives to bring in less expensive homes. And I'm not even talking about affordable homes for the ones that we're building. Um, but at the same time, I look at this and anytime I see the word require, it just means more, more hassle to get things through the process. So when I'm looking at something like require a common driveway cut, I think just having it, you to be allowed to have a common driveway cut would be a huge deal. Um, increasing garage building line, I, I don't like that because that's more impervious cover. And I think where, where the depth is now, I think it's fine for front loading. Um, the no parking minimums, I, I think that's something that I think is good. I, I also, with the smaller, um, smaller um, or, or minimum requirements for, for parking when it comes to smaller homes, I think is also good. I, I get worried about the requiring the minimum distance between driveways just because on the affordable side, if if we have to subdivide into 20 foot foot, foot lots, then and we don't have an access point um, at the end of a block to do a to a shared driveway, it does get difficult. If we could do if we could do a common driveway cut, maybe that solves the problem. But um, a lot of these things, I think if we're we're allowed to do, I think is great. But requiring them, um, especially on the affordable or just on the cost effective housing for the future, uh, becomes dangerous. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Um, I believe I Neil Dykeman is trying to speak from his phone. All right, Neil, are you there? Yes. Go um, right ahead. Maybe, you, sir. So I, I think I mean, the committee is again for kind of the third or fourth meeting in a row wrestling with basically parking issues. And uh, yeah, I think that remains the elephant in the room for most of these changes, which are yeah, um, positive. Um, I'd like to I'd like to point out a couple of things. I think the last you know, comments were were instructive in that um, the the simplest way you got to get the space from somewhere if we're getting more dense. And either no car or you got to cheat some space somewhere. We have looked at things like putting parking like in, in an alley, as as somebody had made the comment earlier. Can you simply have the on street parking on the back side, um, or you take need to take it out of the setbacks, or something as simple as why exactly are we doing double sidewalk streets in places with you know in 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 neighborhoods that have frankly very limited traffic on them and not enough parking as opposed to having you know, covering up you know, culverts with parking and taking up that wasted space um the uh, we're we've kind of pushed towards a a setback model and the and the comment on minimums is 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 real the constraints for development and the costs you know, both get uglier the more minimums are added in. And it doesn't matter what the minimum is, whether it's number of parking spots, distance from the front, distance from the back, distance from the side, distance, you know, uh, length of the parking spot, length of the driveway, width of it, distance from, yeah, it, it's a combination of those that is causing you know, many of the, of the challenges. And so most of these issues need to be dealt with by relaxing some, if not you know, all, to some degree in order to pick up that space. Otherwise, you know, all these good ideas run back into the same challenge of where are you going to you know, uh, get the extra space from? So either go up or you've got to relax one of those setback or distance assumptions. Yeah, and, uh, and I think most of those, unfortunately, also run afoul of, the, of, a, of a twin or a, a, a triple threat of, uh, of public works and you know, or drainage, traffic, and planning. They're not a single department kind of, um, kind of piece and they go together. You know, so all of them are fairly simple solutions, but it's doing each or each of them, but doing all of them at once creates the challenges for, for affordability. And I will repeat, you can build a house of this type in two months from standing start. It cannot be done on site in the city of Houston today. Yeah, that is the challenge and the opportunity for us to to figure out. And all of the any so anything that increases the that um, kind of the level of complexity, even if it creates a route for success, also increases the the cost because the days in that plan review is somebody another um, one of the committee members had commented earlier. It's the combination of uncertainty and time and you know limitations that cause the issues. If you have, if you had to give any of them back, I'd want flexibility on what I can do on the lot, and I'd want speed in that order, and then the rest can probably take care of itself. All right, all right, thank you. So um, I just want to remind the committee, you know, one of the things that we're talking about here, and um, you know, when uh, when Margaret was talking earlier, the director was talking earlier about 
not that we're choosing one over the other, but simply that the impediments to building shared lot driveways or flag lot drives and all of that, the, the restrictions were onerous. And so we're just trying to create a, a more level playing field. Our thought was, if, you know, if, if your property allows you to build front loaders, then you simply do. But we don't want you to build front loaders because you can't build uh, a common driveway, an alley or a flag lot. And so the idea, hopefully, as you've all said, is to make this, generally speaking, to take in mind that, you know, we're going to be living on a smaller scale as we go forward the next 20, 40 years. We're also going to possibly be using less cars. And right now, we all know that Houston has been built for people in cars. And we, we've seen, as Sabita started our presentation, unintended consequences of, of making cars the number one modality and not really keeping in, in mind that other people are walking and biking and now scootering and God only knows well, skateboarding everywhere. So um, I think we've had a really, really good discussion. I think we've gotten a lot of good information and I want to make sure you all understand we are not making decisions today. We are trying to get your input and you've been very gracious in giving us your true ideas and feelings about some of these ideas. So um, with that, I'll close this part of the conversation and turn this back over to Savita. Savita. Yes, sir. Um, thank you for all the comments that we received. Um, so we will take all of this input into consideration and develop uh, proposals um, in collaboration with Public Works. With that, I think we do not have time for smaller developments. It's the second time we are postponing it, but I just want to give a brief of what it means. Can we go to the next slide, please? Devin. Next slide. And next slide. We can stop here. So what this is um, in smaller developments, the idea is to think about um, developments that are uh, or homes that are turned inwards like um, there is a concept of uh, courtyards that we want to explore and also concept of um, using in properties not having street frontage, but they will actually turn inwards and um, can build more higher density when it is like a compact development. So those are the things that we're talking about in smaller developments. And uh, next time for sure we will present this concept um, and discuss ideas with you. Um, with that, we are going to skip this portion and we will go to homework activities. Lynn, are you there? Yes, there Lynn, you. Then please. Yeah, thank you, Chair Garza. And good afternoon, committee members. Today's homework request your input and your participation and a little bit of travel in today's meeting. There's been great discussions uh, about the presentations. We've heard a lot of comments, ideas and input relating to various development patterns. In an effort for each of the committee members to experience the different development styles and patterns that we've talked about today, we want you to go out into the community to specific locations in person. In fact, the assignment is to visit a short list of blocks that we will send to you. Find a place to park your vehicle, assuming that you drove there and walk or bike along the street. By walking or biking, you'll be able to examine and experience the different types of development firsthand, including the many benefits that we've talked about today and some of the challenges that we've talked about today. The blocks included on the list will match the discussion that Ms. Bandy included in her presentation. And staff will send you a list of these locations by Friday of this week, along with the link to letstalkhouston.org forward slash livable dash places, where you'll find a survey that you can provide your feedback. The survey will collect any of your thoughts, any additional comments that you might have, especially if you weren't able to get comments in during today's meeting. Your comments and suggestions will be provided to staff for their consideration as we continue this process. Staff will provide an update on what they've learned at a future meeting 
and we thank you in advance for your participation. Unless there are questions, I'll turn it back over to Ms. Bandy. Thank, thank you, you Lynn. Thank you, Lynn. Uh -oh. uh, hold on, before we go, I show Kathy Payton and somebody else with questions. So Lynn, just to be clear, would you like this done any specific time or just before the next meeting? Um, before the next meeting, so the, uh, if you're asking the question about the survey, some of the images and sites that we identified, we would request the committee members to visit. Um, so you'll have a month, uh, okay. not a month, but three weeks. Thank you. To visit, yes. Also, and Peter, Peter Friedman, I show your hand up, but do you need to, did you have a question or a comment? This is about the previous some previous pictures. I just wanted to make a point. The um, I saw some really innovative designs that Savita showed related to common driveway use. There is a restriction. I think it might be part of fire and safety where you can only have a common driveway of a certain length um, without going back to a street. So just when you're looking at the designs, that might be another another issue that we would run into if we did um, allow for some longer common driveways or other other single access points. Got it. Thank you. Uh, yeah, got it. Thank you. All right. So, uh, Savita, are we now going to the end of the uh, agenda and public comment? Yes, sir. Thanks. Great. All right. My oh. chat feature does Sorry, not see you. Um, Curtis Davis just put a hand up. Oh, Mr. Davis, before we go to public comment, go ahead, please. Oh, uh, yes. Uh, real quick. Um, Today's presentation, will that be available on the website or you'll send it out? And the second, um, in in your future presentations about questions to us about regulatory suggestions, um, I, I, I would suggest you frame it in possibly this way or something similar. A thou shall, a thou may, or a thou may with permissions. So those three areas are kind of what we've been talking about. But if it's a, if it's real clear that it's a thou shalt versus a thou may or a thou may with permissions would be one way to categorize categorize things and make it a little bit clearer. All right, thank you. All right, uh, all right. So we're now going to move on to the end of the agenda and public comment. Um, as a reminder for all of you who are listening in or are not on the subcommittee and would like to speak today, you will have two minutes when your name is called. If you're on a telephone, use star six to mute and unmute. And of course, if you're on a computer, use your microphone button. As we call your name, please state your full name and spell your last name. And um, I am I am not seeing anyone in the chat, so I'm going to need some help from staff to go there. Mr. Chair, um, we do have several speakers. So the first speaker we have is um, Paul Benz, B-E-N-Z. All right, Mr. Benz, are you there? Paul Benz. All right, I will go back to, to uh, Mr. Benz. Our second speaker. Um, the next speaker we have is Eric Himowitz, H-Y-M-O-W-I-T-Z. Mr. Himowitz, are you there? All right, our third speaker. Um, the next speaker I have signed up is George Frey, F-R-E-Y. Mr. Frey, are you with us? Yes, I am. We can hear you, sir. Go right ahead. You have two minutes. OK, uh, just to start, number one, uh, it was not on the public agenda today uh, that the director was going to mention the exemption, the requested exemption changes. And so for that to be to be thrown out there, it's it's a somewhat of a surprise. It's I, I, I would really request that these kind of things get put on a public agenda because there's there are a lot of stakeholders that are that it affects and would like to be more aware of it. Uh, number two, it's very frustrating and disappointing to hear that the different silos within City Hall are not talking to each other. We're not unaware of the competing efforts, the impacts that public works didn't know that the city drainage plan had a requirement, had it had issued its new requirement uh, to require all the lots to have detention requirement. And that, that now public works is trying to eliminate that requirement on, on some configurations. 
I'd also highlight or wonder why why we should be removing why should we remove this exemption to make it a level playing field? Why shouldn't we add the requirement just like the city drainage plan suggested? Add the drainage requirement, the detention requirement universally across the board to preserve our cities, to preserve the neighbors. Uh, because I, I think I heard it specifically, there was widespread applauding to uh, removing a problem for some people who are on the call, re not realizing that removing one person's problem is going to create some serious problems elsewhere for other neighbors that are currently being flooded by rampant development that has no no regard and is uh, frequently uh, requesting variances. I'd also like to remind uh, I'm a frequent caller here and I, every time I, I make the request that or I highlight that this is a focus on small lots, smaller developments. And I always request the need the, that there are very large developments out there. And I would appreciate, I think there is a need to, to go after those large developments at all uh, uh, to, to incorporate them into the plan. And finally, there's all this talk about single family homes and small single family homes, but I'd like to see more coordination with all the other entities within the, the city and try and tie, tie it in uh, the, to, to improve the overall networking of the city. Specifically, I think there was a talk about being a, there's a lot of talk about being, being a, uh, not being a pedestrian friendly city, being a car centric city, but I would like to get rid of my car. And the only reason I have a car is to drive to the supermarket and drive to fields for my children because there, I live in a food desert. There are no, no supermarkets anywhere nearby. There are thoroughfares, major thoroughfares without any crosswalks anywhere to, for me to get across. And Park Sector 12 has not been uh, following up with its 2015 master plan. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Fry. All right, our next speaker. Um, it seems like uh, Eric Himowitz has his microphone back, so I'm calling him up again. All right, Mr. Himowitz, Eric Himowitz, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Thank you for uh, allowing me to speak. Um, I have been building in Houston for over 20 years, um, mainly first floor uh, living homes and two story and um, two and a half story. Um, I think with 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 our company and with I know at least two other builders on this call, um, we've represented thousands of buyers that have moved in that are in front loaders. And I could tell you that young families, empty nesters that don't want to get to their third floor to be in a master bedroom require these front loaders. Um, and, um, you know, somebody mentioned yards. I mean, the, the pictures that a lot of the pictures that are being shown look like utopia. I mean, it looked like somebody's version of utopia and I'll, and I'll, and I'll admit they're, they're beautiful pictures, but from a practical standpoint, um, families and little kids are not playing in these little front yards. And um, the homes that the front loaders, many of them have nice backyards where you can um, have your young children. In addition to that, um, I would think that out of the 80 plus people that are on this call, not many of us will be parking on the street, leaving our cars out overnight. Uh, most of the cars that park in the street are not there for very long um, and they are just guests of homeowners. I would want my guests to be up and close to my home versus having them park on the street. So thank you for your, uh, allowing me to speak. Thank you, sir. All right, our next speaker. Uh, the next speaker uh, is is Ken. Um, I didn't get a last name. So it's, it's in. Ken, are you there? Uh, it's Ken Boyson, B-O-Y-S-E-N. B-O-Y-S-E-N. Uh, yes, sir. Ken, you have two minutes. Go ahead, please. Hey, thank you. I appreciate the opportunity to speak. Um, I'm also a builder in Houston. I've uh, been doing it for well, 20, oh, 21 years uh, starting on now. So th the biggest thing I, I get from this, and, and we put in shared driveways and we do front loaders. Um, 
um, somebody had mentioned uh, the length of a shared driveway. 200 feet is, is the longest that a shared driveway can be due to the turnaround of a fire truck. But uh, the biggest thing that will happen here, you, no matter how you slice it, you're going to have a net decrease in places for people to park. So if they have two in their garage, two in their driveway for every home, you're not going to have that even if you put a couple extra parking spaces, one for each six homes, I think that they mentioned. So then you, your streets are going to be lined with cars. So uh, that homework assignment that was uh, asked, if you're out there and I'm an avid bicyclist, I've ridden thousands and thousands of miles. Imagine riding a bicycle on these roads when both sides are lined with cars because they can't park in, there's no driveway to park in, and you're trying to dodge traffic when it goes through it. Um, to me, that makes it tremendously unfriendly to people that want to have uh, a family and easily access down there. The other thing is those, those pictures where it did show the front load, but you could see the front yard. When If it's all lined with cars and you take that same picture from that same perspective, all you see is a bunch of cars and with a house kind of in the background. So I just want to make sure everybody's understanding what that's what that's really saying, because it's going to change the whole look of a and feel of a neighborhood. Um, Mr. Hamwitz mentioned, you know, yards. You know, if you look at those drawings in the beginning, you know, where they had a, a 10 to 15 foot yard, now they're going to have a three foot yard. Uh, that's a tremendous difference uh, for quality of life of folks that are living in these homes. Um, um, costs. So it, and time. So right now it's probably taking. Uh, Mr. Boyson, your time is up. Could you wrap up, please? Sure. Uh, engineering costs and the time to get through the city to put tr uh, shared driveways in would probably add a couple of months and several thousand dollars to the cost of a home. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much for your comments. We appreciate it. Our next speaker. Uh, the next speaker I have is uh, Richard Mazzarino. Mr. Mazzarino, are you there? Yes, sir, I'm here. Could you spell your last name for the staff, please? Sure, it's M as in Mary, A-Z-Z-A-R-I, N as in Nancy, O. I was so close. I only had one Z. Go it's ahead, sir. Spelled, it's spelled exactly like it sounds, to be honest. Like it sounds, exactly. Thank you. Go All ahead, right. sir. Thank, thank you for your time. Um, I've been building inside the city for 15 years, and 95% of my business is front-loaded homes on 25-foot wide lots. I've built hundreds of them. Um, I believe these proposed changes will destroy my business and probably cost a lot of my 15 employees their jobs, not to mention a lot of tax revenue and fees for the city. I think a lot of us on this call will either be forced to start building single homes on the lots we normally build two on that will have to start at at least a million dollars just due to economics, or we're going to have to move out to the county and start over. Um, my company made the decision about a decade ago to go to a lower density model building front loaders versus common driveways. Our customers don't want single car garages while leaving to have while having to leave their other car in the driveway. Um, has anybody on this call seen how many police reports there are uh, in our city regarding cars that are broken into overnight that have been parked in a driveway? Nothing happens to these thieves either. They get out in a day and are breaking into cars again. Um, People don't want tandem garages. They're being forced to ask their spouse to move their car so they can go to work. We talked about alleys too, which sounded like some really great information, but I would also like to point out that our city alleys are a mess and half of them are built over by private residents. Is someone gonna tell an 80 year old grandma with a garage encroaching into, her, into the alley behind her house that she has to tear it down? I've heard a lot of talk about common driveway homes too, like there's some kind of magic bullet. Um, Again, has anyone in, on this call driven some of these neighborhoods where common driveways are prevalent during non-work hours? I'd encourage you to go look at some of them. Check out the cars that line the streets up and down. These are narrow little streets that when they're this full, two cars can't even pass by one, each, one another, creating traffic jams, safety issues, hazards. Mike mentioned um, hazards for um, waste trucks. Um, Common driveway projects have cars parked all over the place, anywhere they think they can fit their trucks. City trash cans are everywhere. Guest and roommate cars park up and down these narrowed streets because of the added density and reduced parking versus front load homes. Um, common driveway yep. homes also put a lot more strain on already strained infrastructure in our city due to increased density. 
they're undesirable. Your time is if I, can I just finish one more sentence? Oh, yeah, wrap up, please, sir. Thank you. Sure. I mean, our, and lastly, uh, we talk about uh, front doors facing the streets. So while it sounds wonderful, a lot of our customers have expressed concerns about having their front doors accessible from the street, given the dramatic increase in violent crime in our city that seems to only be getting worse rather than better. Just another food for thought. People want the privacy and they want their backyards. All right, thank you. All right, next speaker. Um, the next speaker I have is Taylor. Um, there's no last name listed there. Taylor, are you there? I am. Can you hear me? Yes, Taylor. Would you just state your last name and spell it, please? It's Becker, B as in boy, E-C-K-E-R. All right, Taylor, Ms. Becker, thank you so much. Go ahead, please. Thank you. Um, I'm actually joining today uh, as a concerned citizen and a current resident of a shared driveway community in the city. Um, I actually work for a local builder, which is how I found out about this call and the changes being considered. And uh, quite frankly, it it shocked me and I'm not too excited about it. Um, I've had a terrible experience in the shared com driveway community I live in now uh, with things mentioned already, like the parking issues. These are two uh, car garage homes and a lot of these homes are being rented out. And so the renters are flooding the shared driveway, forcing our guests to park on the street. We've had so many uh, theft incidents in the area, cars getting broken into. Um, and, you know, we're, we're all forced to park on the streets when we don't want to. Um, you know, trash cans left everywhere and dealing with all of these homeowners in the shared driveway community, you know, to come together to improve the community and, you know, things that an HOA is required to do has proven to be the biggest headache um, and I will never live in a shared driveway community again uh, quite frankly I me and my husband are growing our family and we very much look forward to the day that we can own a front loader home in the city we we aspire to do that very soon so I just really wanted to make sure that I, I voice those concerns today while all, all of this is being considered thank you so much Ms. Becker we appreciate your being here um, next speaker who was the last speaker? I was showing uh, an Allison Newport with a hand raised. Ms. Newport? Um, yes, I live in Shady Acres on West 22nd Street, which is commonly shown in the lovely photos from, um, from the uh, playing department. Um, and I just wanted to thank you all for your efforts to address these, you know, super complex issues. I totally, I, you know, we kind of see it all here in this neighborhood. And I get that you know front loaders are very popular um and you know there's a lot of uh skin castle homes are actually some of my favorites in our neighborhood um and i just kind of wanted to say you know thank you for continuing to uh try to address this and and create a livable space for us because i think it's really important and shady acres kind of gets the worst of or it's sort of a good example of some of the worst of all of these issues so Look forward to y'all coming to visit. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Miss Newport. I appreciate it. Um, we had a uh, Paul Benz at the very beginning who was unavailable. Mr. Benz, are you available? All right. Um, hearing that, I wanted to ask if there's anyone else who is listening in who wanted to make public comment and address the subcommittee that might not have been in the chat and might not be listed. Anyone? All right. With that. We are uh, at the end of public comment, and I must say, ladies and gentlemen, we are at 4.59, which I don't think has ever happened before. <laughs> of course, we, we didn't have a chance to talk about small lots, but we will, small lot development, but we will get to it, I promise you. Again, I wanna thank everyone who has been here, whether you're a subcommittee member, or part of the public, um, giving us your information. Um, again, uh, we, you know, our overall goal is to take steps to improve our city for the next year two years 10 years 15 years 20 years and it is a difficult thing to do and that's why we appreciate all of you and your input so with that um if there's no other public comment i will go ahead and adjourn this meeting thank you again ladies and gentlemen we appreciate your being here it is now five o'clock and livable places is signing out thank you again goodbye thank all. you mr chair and the committee members appreciate all the thank guidance. you sonny great job great, you, great job all thank of you